Howdy folks, welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory and today is Tuesday, March 22nd, 2016. And I have the great honor and distinct pleasure of welcoming back to the show Miss Tess Pennington, who has authored several books, including The Prepper's Blueprint. How are you today, Miss Tess? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm doing all right. Well, we've got some really great topics to cover, so we're just going to jump right in. What do you say? I love it. Let's do it. Doing a lot of uh, just some research, just to make some some notes and stuff for, for talking about it. And I totally got into it, and now I want to write a big old article on it now because it's, <laughs> you know... Well, it's, it's, it's important because, you know, a majority of people live in the city. So it's good exactly. to let them know that, you know, it is possible. You've just got to change your way of thinking about it. Yeah. And that's, that was the whole point of wanting to start out with, you know, the urban versus rural during a disaster. I mean, because about 70% of everybody listening to this lives in the city. Exactly. I mean, exactly. that, you know, you, those numbers can't be denied. You know, I mean, there no. are the fortunate few that, that are out there that are that are already protected. They're already away, but they already know what to do. <laughs> They're doing it. <laughs> yeah. So what, Active- do you, what, what do you have to say about that? What does what your research have led you to as far as in, in relation to that aspect? Well, I mean, it, it's it's basically the same stuff that I knew, but I just wanted to get some more details about it. You know, the uh, power grid will be an issue, the water treatment, which is another point that you made, and, um, you know, just how quickly I think this a society can descend into chaos um, when their basic needs aren't met. So, you know, it's and, – and that's actually – Daisy Luther and I are working on a book about societal breakdown. So we're still kind of in the beginning stages of it, but I mean, it's very real and it's something that I think people need to, to be aware of. It's a bleak picture, but you know, I, I think ultimately what, what just going over these, these notes and things from last night is, you know, you can survive, uh, in a, uh, urban setting. You just, um, the, the, you really just need to rely more on your skills and your ingenuity and, and knowing what's going to kind of come about, you know, during that situation so you can stay ahead of the game. Exactly. And one of the, one of the things on a security, um, on the security front in regards to being in an urban setting, which I am, I mm-hmm. mean, I'm, I'm five minutes from downtown. And wow. one of the things that, that I looked at, is the movie I Am Legend, which starred yeah. Will Smith and the way that he had all of his windows set up, which was really cool. I mean, and, and but to bring that into everyday life is a, is a little much, you know. I mean, I can't have guests or my family coming into my home and, and they see that I've got, you know, this uh, fortress Going right. On. <laughs> you know? It's all fortified. Nobody can get out. Nobody can get in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and it's, but I mean, am I supposed to wait till the last minute? Am I supposed to wait till marauders are at the end of the street? Yeah. I mean, when am I supposed to do this? And I'm, and it's not rhetorical. I'm, 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 I'm asking when, when should I take these steps to, start fortifying my house. You know, just given seeing the crime increase, you know, there's those signs that you're going to start looking at and you're going to start seeing. And I think inside of us is that, that uh, innate feeling that, you know what, something's not right and we need to get out of here or we need to, to set this up and you've got to trust your instincts. And, you know, luckily you're kind of in this, you know, alternative news. So you're already ahead of the game, you know, where a lot of people are going to keep thinking everything's fine or they're going to be panicking and not, and just become complacent. You know, you're actually, I think will be one of the the few who will spring into action and, and know how to lock themselves down and fortify the home and that sort of thing. One thing that I was looking at, you know, cause I was trying to find points that, 
supported people, you know, staying in, in, in urban environments during these type of situations. Um, one plus for that is that, you know, there's going to be a plethora of shelters in an urban center, you know, especially those warehouses with like heavy doors and, you know, that type of thing. That's a really great, um, type of area that, that you could fortify, especially if it was like up high so that you could kind of look down and see, you know, what's going on below you. But, you know, there's going to be a, a, a lot of metal rebar and that sort of thing that you'll be able to use, you know, if you needed to, uh, you know, fortify your car to bug out or your home, that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's getting there first is going to be key. Because yeah. if you're if you get there second, forget it. Yep. Forget it's, it. You. That, and that's one of the, the reasons I think why a lot of people, including myself, you know, think that I, we moved out to the rural landscape just you know for a variety of reasons. But you know, one of the things that I was really concerned about was uh, martial law. You know, there's a lot of cities that are gonna you know try and shut shut it down, and you're going to be forced to stay inside your home and. You won't be able to allocate any additional resources. And, um, you know, it's like you said, timing is everything. You've got to have everything in place. So that's, you know, one thing against the urban centers is that. Yeah, and and that's that's a point that I've been trying to get my wife to understand is that, you know, there's only so many ways that you can get out of a city or an, or a you know a densely populated area without going completely rogue. I mean, there's you know the roads are going to be blocked, and it's a mm -hmm. and it's a distinct possibility that the authorities are going to be blocking them with either yep. military or police or a combination mm -hmm. of the two, and you're not going to get out. We lived in Houston, so it was like you know I think the third or fourth largest city in, in the U S and there were refineries and all kinds of craziness. But one of the things that we talked about, because there was only one or two main roads to get out of Houston and, you know, with all the different hurricanes and, you know, when the evacuations that went on, um, we realized that that wasn't a viable option to bug out that way. So we looked at, uh, using the railroad systems and following that out of the city, you know, and, and that's one of those things that, you know, you're going to have to be physically fit, you know, so that you can get out or you're going to have to have some kind of a, a three wheeler or four wheeler so that you can, you can take your family out on. So, you know, there's, there are alternatives, but you know, it's, and I think we'll talk about this, you know, later on, but you, you just got to get creative. You're going to have to think outside of the box and find other ways, you know, finding a stream and following it out. You know, there's lots of rivers where we are, so we can do that, but uh, maybe not so much in, in a majority of the cities, though. Now, as far as you guys being in a rural setting, are you not concerned about marauders coming to you and being more isolated and being a, a little bit more vulnerable, perhaps? I mean, is that a concern? Uh, yeah. It really is. And, you know, with, you know, we, we live, we live in a small California town and, um, it's great, you know, it's very peaceful, but there are, you know, like in any urban or rural or, you know, situ uh, environment, there's questionable people. Yeah. And, you know, I definitely feel a little bit more isolated. I, you know, we've got, a few neighbors, but you know, they're, they all were all on acreage, so they wouldn't hear anything. So we really do have to know our vulnerable points, you know, where, where on our property can people get in, you know, what can we set up to kind of alert us, you know, and we've talked about different security systems, but you know, those are expensive one. And then two, you know, if the grid goes down, you can't access, you know, the footage from your cell phone or from your computer. So, you know, what good is it? So we've definitely um, started looking at, at different ways that we can, you know, 
block access to our property. So, you know, there's that's definitely a concern. And, you know, another one for me is, you know, there's a lot of tweakers out here. You know, a lot of people doing drugs. And, I mean, it's just country living. And, you know, they come into Walmart at the beginning of the month to get all their supplies. And, you know, their lips are smacking and it's a little weird. <laughs> I try to stay away from I try to stay away from Walmart, you know, altogether, but I've been caught there a few times, but, um, you know, that's when the shit hits the fan, you know, they're not going to have access to drugs, you know, they're not going to have access to food and they're going to come looking for it. So, you know, that's one thing my husband and I have gotten, um, you know, our handgun licenses, my, uh, I've got my, um, you know, uh, personal carry license. So, you know, just in case something happens. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a, that's in my opinion, that's a must. You, you mm-hmm. got to have, you know, security on your person at all times. And, and you have to be secure in your skill sets, yes. you know, to be able to, to, to draw if need be. So, um, that's something that I've been working on. I'm, I'm very much a pacifist, but if someone comes at me or attacks my family, you know, that's a totally different situation. Yep. And, uh, you have to train your mind to switch over in that, in that kind of situation. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of components, I think, to prepping, you know, more so than when I first started out, I didn't realize. <laughs> The the depth and breadth of, of what it takes on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and water, you had mentioned water a minute ago and streams and following streams. I mean, is that something that people should be on the lookout? Should they be mapping those things out as I've been doing and figuring out where they're at? And, and can I drink from a mud puddle? I mean, is that, is that, Help me to understand about water sources, because that's going to be a huge element if something goes wrong. And and I want to make sure that people understand that we're not talking about necessarily, you know, a, a completely um, total collapse of society. We're talking about Katrina or some other natural disaster that's going to happen. They do happen. This is called life. And when, I was going to say when Hurricane Sandy hit, you know, it, one thing I love about, you know, the American people is, you know, we all bind together in situations. And with Hurricane Sandy, there were people who had, you know, they set out extra water that they had, they were trying to help, you know, each other out. But when those resources become depleted, it's a totally different situation, you yes. know, and people go back to they're out for themselves, you know, and you can drink from a mud puddle. <laughs> but you need to have a filtration desi- uh, uh, a filtration device on hand, like a life straw, you know. But it's going to overwork your your filter, you know, getting all that sediment and uh, uh, bacteria out. So, you know, there's there's definitely some things you can do, uh, some tricks, you know. And that's something that I I wanted to to say is you, know, you can survive in an urban warehouse or an urban setting. You know, but you're going to have to be able to rely on your skill sets. And now is the time to learn them. You know, one of the most simplest things you can do is um, have a bandana or a, a towel or even a, uh, a, a T-shirt, like a cotton T-shirt tied around your legs and walk through a field with high grasses early in the morning. Uh, you know, you can collect the morning dew. It's called transpiration. It's when the dew settles on the the grasses. Um, you can also collect dew from tree limbs. You know, these are the type of things that you'll have to, uh, fall back on when your short term water supplies run out. Uh, you can also do solar stills have had actually a lot of success with that. It's a, it's a really great, uh, beginner skill set to learn. So, you know, you can look up YouTube videos or, um, online, they can show you how to do it. It's pretty easy. Now, what but, is, now explain a, a solar steel. What is that? Uh, solar steel is basically, you know, you take a, a big bowl and you put grasses, some rocks, um, some dirt in the bottom. You fill it with water. 
the dirty water, whatever water you have on hand, and then you put like a uh, plastic wrap over the top and you put it, you secure it. I usually put like a rubber band around it a little bit and make it a little wobbly because I'll put like a rock on top. So uh, the water will evaporate up. You put it in the sun and it evaporates uh, up to that plastic, the cellophane, and then it drips back down and it collects you put a cup, I'm sorry, you put a, a small cup or bowl in the middle of that uh, debris uh, before you put the plastic wrap on. And so it'll evaporate up and drip down into that small cup. And then, you know, you've got water. There's a lot of people um, in South America that do that. They don't have, you know, gallon water bottles, you know, they're stuck doing it themselves. And that's, that's one way that they do it. That's news to me. I mean, I, I, I knew that you could take, you know, either black plastic or clear plastic and, you know, and either mm -hmm. gather rain or, or generate some uh, evaporation I, like what you described. But as far as the having debris, like the grasses and the, mm -hmm. the dirt in a bowl, that's that's pretty cool. I mean, that's... It, it's just a natural filtration device. And you know what? Uh, I recently read that... Almost every building has, you know, water sprinkler systems and these can hold, you know, thousands of gallons of water. So that could be safe drinking water that you could access or, you know, if you feel like it's questionable, you know, you can always filter it. But um, optionally, there's also buildings that actually have water tanks right on top of their roof. So if you can find, you know, doing research on where the rivers and the natural streams are also do research and try and find out if you know there's any buildings around your area that have these water tanks on the roof because that would be you know huge it, it would, would be gold yes. would that would be like, gold <laughs> not like actual gold it would be like life-saving gold <laughs> right right <laughs> What about antibiotics? I mean, are there are there any antibiotics that you have come across? Like I've read a little bit about the uh, uh, fish antibiotics. I mean, is that something that would be an alternative for people to stockpile, or what? What can I do? I mean, I'm not going to have a you know a, a medicine cabinet full of Z packs and you know. Uh, amoxicillin and all of that i mean are there alternatives to those that that are going to store well and that i should be considering at this point yeah you know I, i've actually purchased the fish antibiotics and you know they're just uh they're the same as as the human type antibiotics but you know my biggest concern the, you have to make sure that you're using the correct dosage so that you don't over medicate yourself. Uh, and also, you know, there are differences in human metabolism versus the metabolism of a fish. So you, you want to take that into account. And as well, you know, there's some uh, antibiotics like tetracycline uh, that can become toxic after the expiration date. So, you know, you definitely want to stay on top of, uh, the expirations. Um, I, there are some reputable, uh, sites for buying antibiotics. Uh, one is, um, antibiotics for survival.com. They're a great site to get, to get those, you know, but, you know, as far as like other ones that I've actually purchased from that site, so I know that they're good antibiotics, but, okay. you know, but there's a lot of other sites out there. I'm just, my biggest concern is how were these meds stored? You know, were they expired? Have they changed the expiration date somehow? You know, I'm always a little skeptical of that, yes. but for me, and, and one of the, one of the other reasons why we moved out to you know, the rural area is because there's a lot of natural ways to, to get, uh, antibiotic properties, you know, and some of those are honey and garlic, um, growing ginger. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of preppers who love, um, colloidal silver. So, you know, having these kinds of, of alternatives on hand, 
you know, re- already grown and ready to go. And you can do a lot of these things uh, in an urban setting as well. You know, garlic and ginger and um, even turmeric are roots. So you just grow those and they're, they're tubers. So they, they reproduce constantly. So you'd have access to that if you started growing them now. So, you know, just staying on top of that kind of stuff and doing research on, you know, when, when the shit hits the fan and all goes to hell, you know, and you're out of antibiotics, you know, what can you grow? You know, what kind of medicinal herbs can you grow to help uh, stave off a flu or uh, some type of virus? So, you know, these are just kinds of this is kind of where I met with my whole prepping journey. You know, I started out with, you know, purchasing the freeze dried foods and, you know, storing the foods. I even wrote a book about it, but you know, now it's, it's for for me, it's more of natural living and trying to get uh, situated so that, you know, when our food stores run out, you know, will I have enough, er, you know, heirloom seeds so that I can grow a garden, you know, and for that matter, have the skills to keep the garden alive because there's all kinds of things that happen with that. So, uh, you know, we have successes and failures, but it's all a learning, a learning game for me. Yeah. that Just getting into the gardening aspect, that would be a whole nother show. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just started, um, I've tried all these different ways of, of gardening. I'm trying to simplify the situation. And this year I'm, I'm trying the straw bale gardening method. So I'll, I'll keep you updated. <laughs> okay, cool. And, and you had mentioned uh, ginger and uh, turmeric and garlic. And I've been reading a lot about these three uh, plants and mm-hmm. it's ginger, turmeric and garlic are like wonder drugs. Yeah. And, you know, some of the, some of what I've been reading and I want to preface everything that we've been saying, uh, Taz said, neither one of us are doctors. None of this is medical advice. So, um, got the disclaimer out there, (laughs) Yeah. uh, you know, but what I'm reading is, is that turmeric attacks cancer cells Mm -hmm. and ginger attacks cancer cells. And they're finding that in these studies that ginger is like upwards of 10,000 times more potent in attacking cancer cells than chemotherapy. I mean, and it's, uh, I wanted that a lot of people are not going to grow these items, but they are imperative that, that people at least consider having them as part of their, uh, prep items, you know, uh, ginger, turmeric, and garlic. Aloe vera, grow some, put an aloe vera plant in your windowsill also. Right. And what kind of shelf life should I expect? I mean, if, I'm, if I've got uh, turmeric root and, and ginger root and I've got them, you know, stored properly, what are you finding in your research shelf life as far as, you know, the, if I've got ginger root, it's still firm. It's still good. How is the potency? Are you finding anything on that as far as it diminishing or increasing or changing at all? I've grown ginger. Uh, it's actually really easy to grow. I mean, you put it in a pot and you water it when it's warm. When it's cold, you bring it in and you continue to water it. And then, you know, within, I think, eight months, um, it's ready to harvest. Fresh, if you if you want to store it fresh, I think my ginger lasts about, I don't know, I guess maybe six six weeks. Uh, what I do usually is I'll, I'll uh, slice the ginger up real thin and I'll dehydrate it and just put it in a storage bag and that lasts. I've, I've had ginger for two years now. And wow. you know, I personally, that's how I like to do it just so that my herbs and roots are ready for me when I need them. So if I want to make a tincture or uh, a tea, like I make a lot of elderberry syrup in the wintertime and I'm, I throw in ginger and dandelion root and all kinds of stuff so that, you know, my family doesn't get sick. So 
Um, that's how I like to store it, you know, and a dehydrator is, you know, a prepper's best friend. <laughs> you can do all <laughs> that stuff with it. So that lasts for years if you do it that way. Okay. Uh, I love, I love ginger. I love turmeric. A lot of people don't, but you know, I'll make a tea out of the turmeric root and, you know, for me it tastes great, but I love, um, herbal methods. I really feel like we have not tapped into the potency of these natural herbs, you know, that just grow wild. You know, there's one study, uh, regarding aloe vera, you know, everybody knows it's great for dry skin and, uh, you can drink aloe juice for, um, stomach ulcers and stomach issues. But there was one study in Thailand that they conducted that said that two tablespoons of aloe vera juice a day um, caused the blood sugar levels in type 2 diabetes patients to fall. So, you know, that's, you know, there's a lot of concern in long term disasters on how diabetics are going to survive. And it's finding these kinds of natural, you know, derived medicines is one way to do that. I've also heard that safflower um, also helps with, with, uh, diabetics too. So, um, again, I'm not a doctor. This is just things that I've read, but, um, you know, these are amazing, amazing medicines that you can have on hand. Yeah, there's, I, I spend uh, quite a bit of time over at naturalnews.com and mm -hmm. that's where I'm, I'm learning a lot about, they, they have articles all the time about ginger, turmeric, and garlic and how to use them and what they do and it's it is it's kind of like cannabis oil mm -hmm. the more we study it the more we find out why they don't want us to have it yeah. well, <laughs> you know because it's like this wonder drug that that just heals the body it heals I it think, i think the uh medical associations are making a killing on you know, killing us with poisons oh, yeah. and they don't want people to know, you know, like, uh, uh, oil of oregano. I, I love essential oils too. I know there's a lot of scrutiny going on about it, but you know, I, I love it. So, you know, oregano oil also has, you know, natural antibiotic properties, you know, in tea tree oil. And, you know, and these are great things that you can have on hand and they store well. Yeah. So the oregano oil, that's, that one is, that's just now coming under the radar for me and the essential oils, all that is like a whole nother realm. Like I said, I'm just now beginning to tap into, but the, these root items are, it's amazing. It is mm -hmm. amazing. So, and there's so many out there. So I mean, it, you just kind of, you can do a, a quick Google search and just type in your issues and, you know, natural medicine, poof, all these things come up. So, you know, I, I've, I have a lot of joint pain. Um, I've got a uh, previous injury, so I've got arthritis in one leg. So, um, you know, I try and, and really rely a lot on natural medicines because, you know, there's, a leave and you know that over the counter medicine's great but it can screw up your liver you know if you take too much of it and you know i just i don't want to mess with, i don't want to mess around with that yeah i love i love these uh big pharma commercials you know where it's all of these items in your body are going to break but you're going no. to fix this one <laughs> right i know i'm like no i really don't want bleeding of the rectum thank you right. or death <laughs> You know, this, this, taking this product can kill you or give you suicidal thoughts and actions. And it's like, yeah, yeah okay, cool. I sign, up. <laughs> sign me up for a double dose. I know. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. So is there, is there anything else that we should cover, uh, Miss Tess? I mean, we, we, I think we've covered quite a bit of ground here. I think, uh, just one thing I, I wanted to go back and kind of circle back to the urban survival. You know, there's, if you, if you plan on staying in the city, you know, you need to know that, you know, pop, population density is going to be your greatest threat. And, 
you know, you need to know that resources are, are, will be depleted. You know, it's not just food and water, but, you know, the power grid's going to fail. You know, there's going to be social disorder. Uh, there'll be th the fuel in the gas stations are going to be depleted much faster. So I know for my husband and I, we were skating through Hurricane Ike and, you know, we had no power. My father was nice enough to give us his, one of his generators. And my husband went to go fill up uh, the gas tanks so that, you know, we could power the generator and a fight broke out at the gas station because you know, people were, it's high stress, you know, and, and you need to understand the psychology of disasters and know that people are, people are not always going to be nice. They're not, they're going to, it's high stress. They're going to be agitated. They're going to want to get this and get out and, you know, things, things happen, bad things happen. So you need to be aware of that. Bad things but happen I, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Disorder, you know, I, I think, I wrote an article, the anatomy of a breakdown. And, you know, I think within four days, you know, there's complete social chaos. Uh, you know, people don't know how to get back to, uh, you know, normalcy, you know, and they're just grabbing, they're grabbing at whatever they can find because they're, they're out of their environment. They're out of their normalcy. So, you know, I think that, that you need to keep all that in consideration. And if you are going to stay in the city, you need to at least plan on, you know, not being able to access food, not having clean water, the power going down, not having a lot of fuel. So if you can get your preps in order with those four things, then I think that, you know, you're, you're starting to get to a good point in your preparedness endeavors, but you know, you also need to make sure that you can fortify your home. Exactly. I was going to say security, security is up there because if you can't, if you can't protect yourself and your family, forget it. Mm -hmm. you, you will be run over. You will be swept there's away. A, there's a, a great book. It's uh, the SAS urban survival handbook. And I think that that would be a really great uh, book for your listeners to, to look into. I think that there's some really great points in there. So, Well, I think uh, that Tess Pennington's The Prepper's Blueprint's a pretty great book, too. I've yeah. heard some pretty good things about that book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good book. And, and you guys, uh, I'll put a link to uh, Tess's books uh, below the video. And we've been speaking with Miss Tess Pennington who operates the website uh, readynutrition.com. And Tess, it's been a, a, a real pleasure speaking with you today. You too. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, we'll do it again very, very soon. Perfect. That sounds good. <laughs>